Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to be invited to give this keynote talk on uh, trabeculectomy-related complications. The original idea was for me to set the stage for the, for the speakers in terms of post-operative complications. But I think what I will do is, after what they have all spoken in, in great detail, wonderful talks, uh, to kind of uh, give you all a broad overview of preoperative considerations when doing a trabeculectomy, intraoperative complications, focusing on how we can surgically manage them should we uh, happen to get them uh, you know, there, and post-operative management, those that have points that may not have been fully covered by my preceding uh, esteemed speakers. So I'm a consultant at the Singapore National Eye Center, and uh, I work with Wilma and Hopkins, and as well I, I do a charity called the Vision Mission. So I'll be happy to meet up with anyone who's willing to collaborate. So I also would like to thank, before I start my, my talk, a few of my colleagues. Uh, in Singapore National Eye Center, we still do trabeculectomy, even though we have a whole gamut of other things like MIGS, tube, but 80 to 90 percent of our glaucoma filtration surgery is still trabeculectomy. Our success rates are about 95 percent or so, and the reason for that in terms of getting 6 to 21 IOP uh, with no complication. Um, and the reason for that is we are very aggressive in managing our blebs and we kind of detail, go through every complication that happens in our fellows' hands, in our hands. So I'm very fortunate and I need to thank my colleagues at the Singapore National Eye Center for gifting me some videos of the complications that they would have encountered during surgery that, uh, that they have fixed. So I think with that acknowledgement, I'll basically be covering, is there such a thing as a perfect trabeculectomy? I'm just going to give you one uh, trap that I've done. Uh, there are many ways of doing it, and whatever works best in your hands. And if you do a perfect trabeculectomy, what can possibly go wrong? It turns out many things, and so we'll see how to sort out these things. Preoperative considerations, intraoperative complications, and postoperative complications and management. That'll be the scope of my talk. Uh, this is how I do a trabeculectomy. Basically, I, um, hey, sorry, sorry about that. So I put a stay suture or a traction suture, and I try to aim for the supranasal quadrant. I make a small snip in the conjunctiva. I inject, I do my surgeries all topical anesthesia. In the case of trabeculectomy, I inject subconjunctival lignocaine neat, and then I inject mitomycin C half strength. I wash it out. And then I create a conjunctival subtenone pocket, like so, phonics-based uh, incision, of course. And uh, I do judicial uh, diatomy. Uh, you do a trape trapezoidal flap. There's no one flap that's noted to be the best in literature. Triangular, trapezoidal, circular. You know, be my guest. Do what works in your hands. I like trapezoidal because that's what I trained with and I'm able to better control my post-operative outcomes with this. But, but really, it's your choice. Then in cases that I do not want to have sudden decompression of the eye, I want to maintain eye in the chamber, I kind of put a pre-placed suture. And then I uh, put a side port. And then, then I do a sclerostomy uh, with a punch. And I snip a small aspect of the iris for iridectomy. And uh, then, while entering the diameter chamber is formed, I do two adjustable knots. I do adjustable knots so that I can test the egress, the aqueous egress from the flap on table itself, and then I can adjust the knot. So here I'm putting a BSS, and I'm testing the egress. I'm quite happy with the egress. I'm quite happy that the anterior chamber is being maintained at roughly uh, mid-teen sort of pressure. And then I lock it off with a perpendicular locking suture. And then I kind of close up my conjunctiva using two, uh, what you call that, two uh, wing sutures or two purse string wing sutures. And for posterity, I add in the mattress suture because we are, we are, all of us are audited. Hey, what happened? Excuse me. Excuse me. Let's close all of that. Hmm. Agya? Huh? Sorry, sir. That's okay. <coughs> right, still, ah, there we go. So I use two wing sutures. I do purse string sutures, and then I do horizontal mattress. And we're quite, uh, we warded ourselves quite rigorously. So our leak rates are 3 to 4% per year because of uh, the, the kind of efforts we take in closing our conch. And I think uh, slightly lower, significantly lower than the TVT trial. But this is all audited data. It's retrospective, mind you, not prospective. So it could be underreported. So anyway, this is how I do a trabeculectomy. Uh, So what are the 
pre-op considerations. First of all, right now we have quite a lot of uh, things available to us in our armamentarium for glaucoma surgical management. In primary angle closure disease, is cataract surgery adequate? In fact, there's a nice, a couple of nice papers by Dennis Lam's group and Clement Lam's group in Hong Kong that tells you in medically controlled and medically uncontrolled primary angle closure glaucoma, a cataract extraction might be good enough. So that's the first thing. I'll keep talking while you fix it. Yeah. So. Might, might that be adequate? That might be adequate sometimes. Second option is whether we have MIGs available to us, uh, like iStent or Hydrus. These devices are available to us currently in Singapore. I think they are going to be available in India soon. I think these might be good options in patients who, uh, ocular hypertensive patients who need treatment, for example, or early open angle glaucoma patients who are undergoing cataract surgery. In this case, trabeculectomy is unnecessary. And sometimes in patients with a failed trabeculectomy, would you like to do a a needling, perhaps I can discuss my needling technique with you and our results, or you could consider doing a tube surgery, or you can consider doing a micropulse uh, transcleral cyclophotocoagulation surgery. These are the options. And next thing, next thing you have to consider is, is it the right time to do surgery? Let's say you have a very complicated cataract or a very difficult cataract surgery. Perhaps you might want to time it such that you stage the procedure, such that you do the cataract surgery first, and then you do the glaucoma aspect later. You could do it in the same day, wherein you do the cataract surgery. Like for example, when I list for a phaco trabeculectomy, I complete a phaco first. Once everything goes well, then I move on to the trabeculectomy option. Or you could stage it if you want to do it that way. So we are moving on to the intraoperative complications that can happen. So of course if uh, cataract surgery, concurrent cataract surgery and it's a complicated cataract, you have had vitreous loss, um, what can happen is sometimes some people they do a partial trabeculectomy, they create the flap first and then they do the cataract surgery and then they complete the trabeculectomy. So if you have already started the trabeculectomy halfway, you might want to complete it, in which case you need to ensure you do an adequate anterior vitrectomy, ensure that the sclerostomy site does not have any vitreous presenting. If it does, do a good complete anterior vitrectomy and then do a slightly tighter closure of the scleral flap, maybe use even helon to push back the vitreous in the initial phases. If the trap has not been initiated yet, perhaps consider closing up the eye, treating the patient medically first before considering a trabeculectomy surgery, perhaps six months down the road. Then there are traction suture problems. Some people do not use traction sutures, some people use traction sutures. If the traction suture is too shallow, like in this particular case, uh, and it rips off, you could, uh, sorry, you could just, uh, in this case it's ripping off, so just recite it a bit more anterior to where you previously placed it, ensure you have adequate stromal, uh, you know, you have taken enough stromal tissue. If it's too deep, sometimes you'll see a bit of leaking from the uh, traction suture site, in which case, if the anterior chamber holds, it's usually not a problem. If it doesn't hold, you need to obviously recite it. So that's not too complicated an issue. Conjunctival peritomy. Too big, you're using too much real estate. Unnecessarily, you're using too much real estate. It can cause further more scarring, and it takes a longer time to close. It's unnecessary. If it's too small, it's too suboptimal of you, you might inadvertently end up tearing the conjunctiva as you hold the tissue. So the ideal uh, conjunctival peritomy is, is basically um, 
how wide you want the base of the scleral flap to be and maybe 0.5 to maximum 1 mm on each side of that and that should be adequate. Uh, too much blood. So sometimes what I do typically in these cases is nowadays I've started pre-treating. So I learned this from uh, the recent WGC conference and this has been published wherein people pre-treat uh, patients who are going for trabeculectomy with prednisolone forte or steroid cover. So what many of my colleagues have started to do is they, they have stopped uh, giving them a hypotensive agent because many of these patients who require trabeculectomy have been on maximal medicines. Their eyes are very red and inflamed and these eyes are known to have a higher failure rate. And if you really want to give the best for your patient, typically what we tend to do is now I stop their, some people stop their hypotensive agents, put them on oral dimox for a week before and put them on uh, prednisolone 40 for one week cover and then typically the eyes tend to get a much quieter and then you can proceed with your trabeculectomy. So that's one option. And of course, you could use uh, discontinuing the blood thinners preoperatively. You could use phenylephrine 10% uh, topically before you start the surgery. And during the surgery, if it's still bleeding, like in this particular case, you could use adrenaline uh, soaked sponges uh, to kind of reduce the ooze and use judicious use of uh, diathemy as well to get you a better view. In this case, it's an aspirin patient who was bleeding a fair amount, but uh, you know, not, not insurmountable once you have diatomy to aid you in. I think the use of adrenaline soaked sponges also reduces the need for too much diatomy because you also don't want to really put too much diatomy and kind of change the astigmatism uh, index in the eye. Scleral flap issues. So when you're creating the scleral flap, you might prematurely enter the anterior chamber. This in itself is not a big deal because subsequently you need to enter the anterior chamber anyway. But the idea is you do not want too much flip-flopping of the anterior chamber. You want it to remain deep throughout the surgery as far as possible. These pressure fluctuations, especially in very advanced glaucoma eyes, are what is known to lead to wipeout, which is something you definitely don't want. So the, the most, I mean, as much as you can avoid, you want to keep the anterior chamber depth. Uh, so what you would do in these cases if you have prematurely entered the anterior chamber is to put in a little bit of heel on a viscoat to kind of keep the eye formed while you continue with the rest of the surgery. That's one option. Now, with regards to flaps being too thin or flap tearing or the significant flap avulsion even, what can you do? So I'm going to create, uh, show you some surgical videos provided by my colleagues. So in this particular case, the resident created too thin a flap or so the, 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 the attending felt. So what he did was to kind of create a second layer. And by creating a second layer, you essentially have much lower times. You have more tissue to hold, less chance of you tearing it out, less chance of you kind of uh, causing evulsion of the flap. My opinion has gone a little too deep, almost deep sclerectomy level in my opinion, but hey, that's fine. That's one option. And a flap tear. In this case, uh, the resident unfortunately went a little too anterior when creating the flap. And uh, inadvertently, he created a hole within the scleral flap, which will definitely lead to a leak later on. It could lead to hypotony. So all these things must be preemptively sorted out. And at the end of the surgery, they realized that they had made this mistake, as you're going to see. So they kind of tested the eye, and they realized that the anterior chamber is shallowing too fast. And you can see there's a leak there. In this case, luckily, it was a small tear. So they could actually primarily repair it with a box suture using a 10 o nylon suture. So you don't want to put one stitch across, you want to put a box stitch across so that you can kind of spread out the tension. And then of course you can, you can uh, stitch the anterior aspect of the flap so that you direct the flow of aqueous posteriorly through the flap. And then you do a good closure of the conjunctiva of course. A large tear, what do you, what do, you do? I hope this is not the same resident but essentially what they have done is once again they have torn through the anterior aspect of the flap, created a big tear and uh, this is clearly obvious so the attending took over and he actually kind of used a scleral autograft, created a flap the other side, and then patched that sclera over this particular area. Of course, if you have access to a scleral flap, or you, some people, they use a tenon autograft as well. That's, that's acceptable management. But essentially, you cannot leave it like that. Because in this case, you cannot reset because you've already created a trap. So this is one way to kind of do it. So you basically stuck it on that area. So iridectomy, if it's too big, it can cause diplopia, image distortion, glare. If it's too small, sclerostomy could get occluded. So if it's too posterior, it can cause bleeding, especially when you cut through the scleral spur and the choroidal area, and sometimes vitreous may present. So idea is to keep it just the right size. Some people, after a, uh, if in the pseudophagic eye, they don't even do an iridectomy. So that's your choice. But I think we tend to do it. We tend to keep it peripheral. We tend to keep it small. So in this case, is a patient wherein they have done a little too big a sclerostomy. You can see that uh, 
the first snip was okay, right in the blue zone, but he went a bit overzealously and he did a second snip posterior to it. So this is actually choroid presenting, which they didn't realize. So then they make a nice snip without realizing it. And then, unfortunately, a blob presents, and they were not sure whether it's vitreous or viscoelastic. It was vitreous, surprise, surprise, which is why I'm presenting this. So what they did was they used viscoelastic to push back some of the vitreous. They did an anterior vitrectomy to keep it as clear as possible. These cases tend to have a higher failure rate. Okay, that's, that's, So the, of course, the treatment for this is to avoid it. But if this happens, do a manual good vitrectomy, ensure there's no more vitreous presenting at the sclerostomy site. And then, uh, in this case, you can tightly suture the flap. Medically manage initially before you re-establish uh, some sort of flow. Sometimes you might need to do a YAG vitrolysis as well in the entry chamber if, if it gets blocked subsequently. So this, you need to keep a... Say again? Yes. Yes. Conjunctival closure. So they're kind of go through, going through every step of surgery where things can go wrong. So here there's a buttonhole with you. I didn't get the part where they showed it on fluorescein strips, so trust me, it's there, and you'll see it uh, becoming evident very shortly. So here we're doing a cross suture. So a buttonhole, what you must be very careful is these conch tend to be very thin. Any tugging of the conch, it tend to be scarred very thin. So any pulling or any counter-traction can lead to more buttonhole formation as you try to repair the primary buttonhole. So be very careful. So you can see there's a leak there. So what he has done is he has basically don't use any counter-traction, use a round body needle, a 10-0 nylon suture, and he does a cross suture across the area of the buttonhole. Don't make it too tight. You don't want to pull on the conjunctiva. Remember, you don't want to cause other buttonholes elsewhere. And then that's it. The other way to manage this is to kind of undermine the tissue and use the posterior aspect of that wound to bring it further close in. But it might be difficult in a very scarred conjunctiva. So that's that. So post-operative complications have been quite well covered by my colleagues, so I won't go into too much depth that the IOP too high, IOP too low, late post-op complications. So this is a didactic list which we have gone through, so I won't talk about that. I'll go to the surgical aspects quickly in the interest of time. So bleb failure, I am a proponent for needling. I do it intraoperatively. We have published data from John Hopkins when I was there, wherein we have a rough rule of thumb. Any, our average age of trabeculectomy that we try needling for is five years. So five year old trab onwards, that's our average age of bleb that we do needling for. And we found that our complete success in achieving target pressure, not below 21, target pressure, which tends to be on average 14 to 15, is 33%. And on average, qualified success is another 33%. On average, the other third tends to fail despite our best efforts. In this case, we then go to doing a tube surgery as per the TVT trial, right? So I think that's, that's the evidence for it so far. And of course, the many needling studies are not great because they tend to be retrospective. And uh, you'll find across literature there's varying success rate anywhere from 20% to 90%, depending on whether they do it, in the, do it by the slit lamp or whether they do it in the operating theater. So you've got to view everything with a pinch of salt. But in our hands, this tends to work. So what I do is, uh, this is an OCD risk scan that tells you how scarred the bleb is. This is a 12-year-old bleb. A patient was scheduled for a tube surgery that I poached for my colleague to try needling. I said, let's try needling. Let's try to make this work first. If it doesn't work, I'll pass it back to you if you want for tube surgery. So in this case, I do an AC maintainer so that I get immediate feedback. I use a mini MVR blade, go as posterior as possible to the bleb. Find the right plane, do sideward cutting motion. Avoid blood vessels. You don't want to cause too much subconscious hemorrhage, which, is, which defeats the purpose of needling. Um, and then... With MVR blade, gives it, it gets me faster results. Anterior chamber maintainer at 100 cm gives me immediate feedback and kind of helps me lyse the tissue better. So I get a nice diffuse bleb at the end of it. This patient is now nine months post-operative, uh, getting an under target pressure of 15 and without need for medication. So I think I've saved him a tube at least for now. And there's OCD that shows that it's kind of diffuse, nice low diffuse bleb that I get at the end of these procedures. Bleb revision in cases that are blebitis, you treat them medically first. Once you've kind of cleared the infective phase, then you try to revise the bleb. This case was a sweating bleb, about a five-year-old bleb, sweating. I had a blebitis, we treated medically. So now we are kind of undermining, we are kind of cutting off that avascular area. And then we're undermining the surrounding tissue uh, subtenons so that we get some space and some mobility of the underlying tenons and... Uh, and conjunctiva. So once I've excluded this, I look at the flow. The flow is not too bad. The anterior chamber is maintaining. I don't need to do any patch craft or anything for this particular uh, bleb. So I'm just undermining the tissue. 
and then I do a layered closure, or you can do a combined closure. That, that's up to you. So I do a layered closure, bringing the tenons forward, and then I do a conjunctival closure. In this case, we were lucky. We had enough mobile conjunctiva to play with. Sometimes if it's truly, truly scarred up, you could consider other procedures like even a limbal incision to kind of relax the conjunctiva, or you could consider doing even a conj autograft should that be required. But so far, we have managed to do this technique for, for most of our patients, and they tend to do well. Some people even augment this procedure with uh, subconjunctival 5 fluorouracil or mitomycin C because after you do a revision these these eye pressures tend to go up so I, I would manage that post-operatively rather than intraoperatively depending on how the patient responds to my surgery transconjunct oh this is one thing I would, like, I would like to talk about I did this but I don't have a video of my own videos so I had to acknowledge YouTube for this really and I learned this technique when I was in the US wherein it's a much quicker way to sort out bleb dysesthesia or even hypotony wherein we do a transconjunctival suturing of the flap that the key in this procedure is to first identify where the flap is, use whatever methods you have to identify the bleb, kind of um, compress upon the bleb area, even if avascular, know where it is, and then uh, use a tenor suture transconjunctivally to kind of uh, reappose the, 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 the bleb, the, the flap. And you're going to see this procedure. It's very quick. If you do it well, it takes five minutes, and most of the time the problem gets solved. The concern about blebs being too thin, somehow it doesn't feature. And they have studies that are published that the leak rates are not high. In fact, there is hardly any leak rates. Even, even in my own hands, I've done maybe three of this so far. Not too many, to be honest. What happens is within one week, this transconjunctival suture gets buried under by itself. And the conjunctival epithelializes over it. So it's quite surprising. So I don't need to bury the knot. I leave it as it is. I check the anterior chamber depth at the end of it. And that limits the flow posteriorly kind of reduces the bleb height, reduces the diffusion of the bleb, and keeps it going posterior, which is what we want. Some people do three, four. It depends on what you see on table. But this technique, I find, is much faster than having to open up the conjunctiva, go back in and mucky tissue. And these are all many old late bleb uh, hypotony. So I, I find this technique much quicker. And I don't see what's the downside of trying this. Try this out. If this doesn't work, then you move on to the usual way of, under, uh, of opening up the thing. So coronal drainage was also covered by my colleagues, so I won't go through the didactics of it. Of course, try medical treatment first. In patients with persistent vision loss or kissing choroids or sub supracoronal hemorrhage, you need to drain it, you need to drain it. Plus minus anterior chamber reformation. This is the way that I do it. Uh, I put an AC maintainer. I put two stays sutures so that I'm getting better control of the eye in terms of where I want to move it. I give a sub tenons block, and about uh, three, to, I mean, about four to six mm behind the limbus is where I cite my uh, uh, what you call that uh, the, 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 the sclerostomy. So here I'm creating a peritoneal a conjunctival sort of incision, circumferentially, and then I do diatomy, and then I create a radial incision, which you'll notice. And using a blade gin gingerly, gingerly until I see some serous fluid. You diatomize first so that you get some better view. And then once I see yellow fluid, I stop. And then I use two tooth forceps to kind of open up the wound. And then you will see some serous fluid. And you will see some supracoral hemorrhage, deep red blood coming out soon. Watch this. See that? That's one side. So this was done one week after the patient's symptoms of sudden pain, uh, AC shallowing. And low pressure, even though you had a supracoronal hemorrhage postoperatively. There we go. So if we do a second side 180 to 90 degrees away from the, the first sclerostomy side, we leave the sclerostomy open and we close the conjunctiva over it. And that usually does the trick. And I keep my AC maintainer on to keep, uh, keep the flow going. Can you on that? Yeah. So in summary, careful pre-op selection is important. Choose wisely because you have many options like angle closure glaucoma. You can do just cataract surgery. You have MIGS available to you soon. You could consider that an early open angle glaucoma. Prevention is better than cure. So optimize your eye prior to subjecting a patient to trabeculectomy. Giving them pre-operative steroids is not a bad idea. Read up the literature on that. It's quite uh, promising. Uh, stopping uh, anticoagulants and blood thinners before the op is a good idea too. Less blood, the better in trabeculectomy. Uh, stage the surgeries if required. You're in no hurry. If you can do a cataract first, Wait for at least six months before you do the trabeculectomy. Studies have shown that the success rates are lower when you plan it too close together. So at least six months apart. And then think through each step of the surgery, especially residents, you know, you uh, should go through that. And maximize your, you know, you really got to maximize success for each trap performed. I think with that, I conclude my talk. And thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jain, for those excellent uh, videos on uh, your techniques of managing the complications. As you all know, it's only half the battle won by doing a neat uh, and clean uh, glaucoma surgery, be it trabeculectomy or uh, glaucoma drainage device. 
how you manage the post-op period is, uh, I mean, is what uh, decides the success of surgery. So generally, we, uh, these surgeries, uh, they, uh, the post-op period is considered as a roller coaster where the pressures initially could be no low or normal and then slowly it could rise up and then you try to uh, do some uh, intervention and then again the pressure drops. So it's like a roller coaster. So the management of post-operative period is uh, most critical for uh, glaucoma surgeries. Uh, I think we have time uh, for to take in few questions. If uh, anybody has any uh, questions, can, you can just come forward. Uh, uh, that trabeculectomy when you uh, showed the video, mm -hmm. uh, did you say you inject the MMC under the? That's interesting. That uh, uh, can you just uh, elaborate on that step? Yeah, so I think many of us in the world, I'm not sure whether Aravind does this yet. Do you all inject? Inject. Yeah, so many of us in the world have now moved towards injection of MMC rather than using sponges for various reasons. Uh, sometimes sponges can get lost and that's horrible. It has happened once I think in the history of SNEC where and that's horrible. And secondly, sponges take a bit more time. Thirdly, with injection, we have done a comparative trial. We have found no difference in success rate between sponges and injection. But anecdotally, I'll be honest, it's not no proper evidence for this. Anecdotally, we find our blebs to be lower, more diffuse, less avascular looking. Success-wise, it hasn't shown any difference. So you don't need to, no, no one needs to, it's not significantly better, but I feel in my hand it's much better ever since I switched. What we do is we make a small snip in the conjecta. What This is my technique that I found in Wilma. We make a small snip, we inject lignocaine. I do it under topical anesthesia. The subconscious lignocaine helps me separate the layers. And then I use a Rykoff cannula, which is not a blunt cannula, 30 gauge or 27 gauge cannula, to go as posterior as possible over the area where I expect scarring. And then I inject about uh, 0 0.3 to 0 0.6 mils of half strength MMC, half strength is 0 0.2 mg per mil of mitomycin C and mitomycin C binds to the tenon. The scarring largely is in the subconj and tenon area. How long do you wait? So I don't wait, so I just inject it and then I do a, a flushing as you notice there, I, I flush using a, a literally, remember I have a small hole that I created a peritomy through, so I'm injecting my mitomycin C and then I'm flushing normal You didn't see the cannula, saline. you just directly with a syringe so, you just injected. So there are two ways. So one is my friends use or my colleagues use 30 gauge needle to actually inject it into the tenon space so the tenon balloons up. Other way, what under I the do, tenons, uh, uh, under tenon, no, actually intra tenon, intra actually intra tenon. I do it under the tenon. So what you saw there was under the tenon. You're correct. So I use a blunt. I don't want to have any uh, cause for concern when I'm using a sharp instrument. Especially, I'm not really seeing it. So I prefer to do it with a blunt Rykoff cannula, and I find that it works equally well. I'm not getting any different in success rate compared to my colleague who uses a sharp needle. So I injected sub tenon, and the MMC binds well to the tenon. I stop literally when I see MMC flowing out through that wound. So when I see it's flowing out, then I, then I stop, and typically it tends to be 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 mils, and then I flush it, but it is more of a, so there's you no go, waiting. You go posteriorly? Yeah, so I'm using my Rykoff cannula, I'm going about 3 mm posterior to the limbus, and I'm going through the mainly superior and supranasal area, so that's where I want my flow to be, that's why I don't want any scar to be. So I, I find that it works in my hands, and I think it saves 2 minutes of my surgery. Percentage, oh. say, same thing that you use for sponge, uh, that percentage. Well, no. uh, percentage. That is about uh, point zero. So for sponge, I use 0 0.4 mg per mil. That's what we used to use. 0 0.04 mg per mil. Ah. So that's 0.04%. Uh, 0.04%. Correct. 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 Same thing. No. Same thing. So I'm, I'm halving it. I put 0.02%. Uh, 0.02%. Yeah. Okay, okay. Dilute it further. Just, uh, thanks, Jane, for all those explanations. One more thing uh, to add that is with sponges, like we are not sure like how much mitomycin is getting delivered. Yeah. And here the great advantage is like you are really sure like you have injected how much of mitomycin. That's one added advantage of this injection. Also, I didn't see you uh, dissecting much, mm. uh, you posteriorly know, in your, your posteriorly into this. Does the mitomycin see, does the work of the dissection? Almost like a hydro dissection. So the lignocaine helps me do that part. And then I, I've, I've used my uh, Westcott scissors to know that I have a pocket there that's cleared. So I've actually done, I have actually gone under, cleared a pocket. Once I'm happy with the pocket, I have already injected mitomycin C in that area. I tend to be happy. And my needling rate is about 12% so far in the last two years. So it's reasonable. 
we oh. also do uh, uh, the subconjunctival injections, but what Jain, you had shown is more of subtenance uh, kind of an injection. Yes. Yes. And we don't generally wash uh, because we are just injecting it into the subconjunctival space. We, re we really don't wash it. We wait for some time, we wait for 10 minutes, and then we start with the procedure. So there's a bit of voodoo. There's no evidence to this. I have a colleague who purposely washes it. So he believes, and this is voodoo, this is not science, wherein we, when we wash it, he's, I'm using a jet to because remember, I'm injecting it to a very small peritomy. Mm -hmm. It's a, almost like a valve effect. So when I inject a lot of a BSS to flush it out, first of all, I don't want any MMC to be on the cornea. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I'm pushing the MMC Back. backwards. Uh, it's whether you want to believe it or not, I don't know. But it's, he loves it, and usually he gets very nice diffuse blood. So there is some uh, truth to it, I think. So I don't know. That's, why, that's how they flush it. Okay. Jaint, you showed the other video on uh, in a pseudophagic eye. Do, you're doing the trap and there, there's a rent, uh, I mean the vitreous comes uh, out. Yes. So uh, do we, uh, that is because uh, while doing the PI, this has happened. So can you avoid a PI in a pseudophagic eye? Yes. Would that be better, especially in uh, pseudo-exfoliation eyes? Yeah. So I'm going to be mean now and say that's my resident who did it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, essentially, I think the mistake was he went to, po uh, went to posterior. posterior. It so can happen so it, was, any it can happen to anyone. It can happen to anyone. So what happened was the first cut was good. The sclerostomy was good in the blue line, gray, the gray zone. Then a second cut to make it bigger because he's scared of occlusion, he did one more. So it went posterior. And then what presented was actually not iris, it's actually choroid. Right? And then he pulled on that and he cut it. So that is asking for vitreous to come. So how do you avoid it? By trying to, even if that comes, you don't cut it. You go further in front, pull the iris tissue, uh, you don't want to go too much either. You still want to keep it peripheral. But that, that, that knob is to recognize as seniors. You need to recognize as choroid. Go a bit further in front and then cut a small snip. Can you avoid a iridectomy in pseudophagic eyes? Yes, there are many people who do that. Somehow we don't do that. Because uh, that's in a pseudophagic eye, the chamber is, yeah, yes. and then the iris has already fallen fallen nicely well behind. I must admit so, and uh, again, pulling out the iris would be a difficult thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you make two or three attempts, you tend to invariably uh, reach the vitreous. I then. agree. But the problem is, and some people like uh, Harry Quigley, my mentor and Wilma, believes that angle closure disease is more of a posterior disease rather than anterior disease. So a lot of them have a choroidal problem. Choroidal so expansion. we find that, I mean, this is anecdotal again, there's no evidence for, for or against. Especially in my Asian eyes, that 80% of my patients are Chinese. <laughs> So they tend to have very narrow, even after pseudophagia, yeah, sometimes they don't tend to deepen as much as I would like them to. So to avoid that possibility, we all tend to still do iridectomy, but I think it's a very fair point to not do an iridectomy. And if you need it later, you can always do a PI. Yeah. So, so I think that's, that's a fair point. We just don't do that. Yeah. I have one question for you, Jaint. If a trabeculectomy fails and if done needling and post-needling, there is still failure. What would be your choice? Would you go for a repeat trap, or would you go for a tube, or would you go for a micropulse? Uh, good question. That's a, that's a separate topic on itself, and we need to debate this. <laughs> but I, I, uh, many of my colleagues don't believe what I do. They, they like to take, do the needling in the slit lamp, because first of all, I'm wasting OT space by doing a needling in the OR. Secondly, it takes more time to put AC maintainer in. But I really believe if I've done my needling to the best of my ability using that technique, and it still fails, uh, there are two options available to me. One is I can talk to the patient about repeat needling, but if it's a very old bleb, I know it's going to fail again. Mm -hmm. So yes. in those cases, then I would go, the TVT study tells me that doing a repeat trap is not good. You can argue that your trap is damn good, etc., but you are already failed. You're starting on a failing note already. So what makes you think that your new trap is going to succeed? And evidence already shows that repeating a trap is going to have higher failure rate. So based purely on evidence, I would do a tube surgery. Now, the question about micropulse TCP is a good one, because that's a new kid on the block. Um, so I'll give the patient options. Uh, I'll give the patient option of, look, micropulse TCP has a lower efficacy. It's more temporizing in our hands. Uh, but, but we could stay away from, if he's still, he can tolerate eye drops. I say, if I do micropulse TCP, there's a it's chance I can lower your drop. pressure. Uh, correct. It's equal to one to two drops. So I said, look, if I can lower your pressure with micropulse TCP, I can avoid a device in your eye. Would you want that? And increasingly, more of my patients are going towards MPTCP. The right answer by evidence is tube. But I think increasingly, we are using MPTCP. So that's a bit of art. And we are trying to come up with evidence. I'm actually doing a study now comparing diode versus MPTCP versus tube. And the results are promising. I don't have exact data. I don't want to give the wrong data here on stage. But it's promising is what I can say. And we'll publish it soon. Mm. 
your decision change uh, depending upon the state faking status or the studio faking status to decide on a tube or a micropulse? It is a fake guy for micropulse. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not a proponent for uh, blood needling. Yeah. Somehow yeah. it's a temporary measure yes. and uh, uh, the uh, long-lasting one would be going yeah. for a trab or a tube. tube. And one more thing about the blood needling water. Repeat, uh, repeat, uh, repeat, 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 repeat trab. Repeat needling. Re yeah. No, no I would go for a repeat trab. So we can uh, still go for a repeat trab. It would uh, be functional at least for one or two years before... Uh, we were doing repeat traps as well earlier before we started doing many of the tubes and what we used to do was when we don't do the trap in our institute when it was done elsewhere we really don't know whether they've used anti-metabolites in that case we would go for a we used to go for a repeat trap but those which had failed in our hands has a high chance of failure yeah, again yeah, so we go for the tubes one more thing regarding the success rate following a needling is like uh, depending upon like what sort of bleb we are taking up for needling. If a bleb has been functioning for some time, for some years and then started failing, the literature says that like the chances of the Reviving. bleb survival, mm. revival will be better than a non-functional previous non-functional bleb. So and it that works also well matters. for the insisted yes. blebs. Yeah, the blebs which has worked for some time and failed, the needling will give better results. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But traditionally uh, speaking, they say that uh, bleb revision uh, should be taken up within the first three months. Usually a uh, bleb that starts failing late is more likely to fail. Uh, I, mean, I don't know so, why. So I'm going to disagree with some of the comments here and it, it's fine to do that, I think. So I think needling, I needle every bleb that comes to me. People the think is condemned bleb, I will still needle them because I have mm -hmm. kind of gotten results that seem to prove that I can save some eyes because the next step in my opinion is not a repeat trap. Once again I also disagree with that statement because you've already failed a trap once. TVT tells you that it's going to fail, higher chance of failure. So even if you are very good trap surgeons, which I think we all think we are, I don't think your success is going to be high. So I think I need to give the patient the next best shot. So MPTCP is a new non-invasive kit on the block. So therefore that's an option that I can consider. But tube, I think, in my opinion, is good. And for me, I really think needling works. And if I, if I fail, the risks are so low. So what am I losing? Not much. So I think I try needling the best way that I know. If it still doesn't work, then I will move on to... So that's my option. That's what, uh, yeah. yeah. By the way, when you needle, the purpose is to cut all the subconjunctival fibrosis. Yes. But do you introduce the needle on between the two scleral flaps? It depends on what I see on table. So if I'm unable to, if it's just ring of steel, it's easy. Yeah. Ring of steel is the best bleb to needle. You just cut the thing, the bleb goes diffuse, you stop your, you, 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 you enjoy the success and you get out of there. But if I find that, despite that, in this case, it is very like 10 year old bleb, it's really scarred down. Then I might, in that case, when I'm not getting a good bleb, I will go under the flap. I might even go under the flap into the anterior chamber to reestablish the conduit. Then I could do sideward cutting motion and come out. Yeah, so it depends on what I see on table. Mm, that's my answer. Okay, I think we'll just...